And so the prophet spoke of God's will and purpose to restore to his people what he had taken, in some sense, what they had lost, certainly. Many times, down through the generations, specifically in the days of Noah and in the latter years of Israel and Judah, they experienced this loss because sin is a taker. It brings great loss to the sinner, to the one who works it, to the one who gives themselves to these uh, corrupting things, to these things that destroy. They actually give themselves to the destroyer. They don't know it, but they give themselves to the destroyer, and he's effective in his destruction. The work itself, the works of the flesh, are of themselves corrupt and corrupting to the one who allows them to dominate to the one who gives themselves to those works. Those works destroy and corrupt of their own nature, whatever good thing that they enter or they are allowed to enter. The mother and father of our race forfeited their standing with God and lost their exceeding good place with him and the environment that he had made for them and granted to them in which they would serve him and fellowship with him. Sin corrupted them and everything that they touched, and they lost precious treasures. And God thrust them out of that place that was designed, structured, and granted them for their good. Later then, God removed the whole race that had become utterly corrupt, and every imagination of their heart was only evil continually. And God said, I'm grieved that I've made them. I will destroy them with the earth. Every living thing that breathes, I will destroy them. He revealed to Noah. Save for one man, because God's favor, God's grace was upon him. Israel then, of course, is a prime example of these things in succeeding multiple generations, despite God setting his love upon them, despite then his warnings to them when they gave themselves to the things that they knew were condemned of God, that he would not receive, that never entered his mind. He used this kind of language to them, not to give themselves to the things that the nations practiced but they did and so God had thrust those nations out of the land and he promised I will thrust you out as well and he kept that promise we know he kept that promise they rejected God's kingship and the revelation from him who was the shepherd of their souls but they rejected these things one of the prophets described it this way these are Ezekiel's words. Of course, a hundred years before Ezekiel, Israel had been thrust out, cast away. And Ezekiel is the one who says, through whom the Lord says, I thought that Israel's sister would see and learn, but she didn't. But God says, my eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity. I will repay your ways and your, ab your abominations will be in your midst, then you shall know that I am the Lord. That phrase is repeated again and again and again in the writings of this prophet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And most of the time it's connected to punishment. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Because he had fulfilled his word that he had given them through Moses centuries before. Thus says the Lord, a disaster, a singular disaster, behold, it has come an end has come the end has come it has dawned for you behold it has come doom has come to you you who dwell in the land the time has come a day of trouble is near not of rejoicing in the mountains now that was what preceded the words of this text that we're giving attention to this evening now when isaiah spoke this text of course 
It was 100 years before. In Isaiah's day, during his ministry, the tribes of Israel were being taken away by Assyria. In that very day. Yet he was speaking of things, again, like our last lesson from Genesis, and the promises were made to Abraham. He heard of things that he would have no personal part in at all. Yet he believed God, and God counted that to him as righteousness. Even so, these words, uh, Isaiah would have no direct part in. The people that he's speaking to, the generation that he was speaking to, would have no direct part in them. But God, you see, gives a testimony of these things Amen. through his prophets so that when they do come to pass, as the master said, you would know. So you will know. I tell you now so that you will know. Yep. See. And they got these words about both punishment and wrath and blessing, cursing and blessing. Moses is the one who charged them to choose life. Choose life, he said. But, of course, they didn't. They didn't. They were greatly deceived. And they had no power in them. So these words, then, are the words of God asserting his power in their lives and granting them these things. I, after Brother Michael's sermon this morning, I told him uh, that his sermon was about the things that the wicked lost all the things that they had they would lose at God's hand well this text text that sister Annie just read is about what the what God's people would receive at his hand the good things that he would give to them your son shall make haste see he he just he had just said or they had just said to them, or he had just said to them, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Yeah. And before that, the Lord has forsaken me. My God has forgotten me. That was, that was what they would be saying, see, at some point in their history. God says, I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your son shall make haste. Your destroyers, those who laid you waste, shall go away from you. See, he would grant them good things, from themselves, you know, you have, I'm testimony, you have sons through yourself, you know. They come from you. <laughs> you give your life to them. They, you give your life to them. You give life to them, both in their birth, through their birth, and in their growing. You give yourself to them. Note my gray hair and my failing eyes. <laughs> you give your life to them. It's gone then, see? You don't get to keep that. So God does these things in us, his people. He did these things. He would do these things in his people. Your sons shall make haste. They're involved, you see. They're involved. We're involved in these good things of God. Your sons shall make haste. Your destroyers, those who laid you waste, shall go away from you. Lift up your eyes and see all these gather together and come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall surely clothe yourselves with them as with them all as an ornament. Bind them on you as a bride does. These are good things that God himself would give, see. He's going to provide these things. As I live, says the Lord. Behold, I will lift my hand and an oath to the nations, set up my standard for the peoples. They shall bring your sons in their arms. Your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. These are things that God would provide, that he would work in his people after they had had great loss. Precious ones and precious things God provides in us and for us by his goodness, by his kindness. The prophet speaks of these things that God brings to those whom he reconciles to himself. He has reconciled us to himself. Amen. He has brought us to himself. And despite the things that we once had lost, now he is in the process of restoring to us. And he works it in us, not in spite of us, not despite of us, not despite us, 
but in us. He works those things in us only as we yield ourselves to him in faith. We spent uh, a good portion of the morning speaking about this, didn't we, in Brother Ricky's lesson, about the work of faith, the obedience of faith, the power of faith in the believer. So we're engaged in these things, and he works these things in us. This is the message of the exposition of the Gospels that the apostles delivered, especially Paul, delivered to the believers. That they yield themselves to God's will and purpose as they once yielded themselves to the course of this world. Now he urged them to yield themselves to the call of God. Give themselves. This is a text that we considered last Wednesday evening. Yield yourself. Walk worthy of the calling with which God has called you. See, that's what, that's what those words are talking about. Yield yourself to these things, and he will work in you exceeding precious things that you could never obtain yourself. But he will work them in you. They will come from you, not externally, <laughs> although the power comes from some other place. It works in us. That's what the apostle was praying for the believers there in what we call Ephesians 3, isn't it? That they would see his exceeding, I'm sorry, in chapter 1, but, but also in chapter 3, that they would see this exceeding power that works in us and the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of the love of God that is in Christ Jesus that is beyond knowing, that they would see these things then and yield themselves to them. And the basis of us doing this is that God has promised he will restore. He will restore these things to his people. He will give, he will give these good things to them. Uh, else we would not have them. We would not have these exceeding precious things that he provides those who engage him in fellowship that he calls us to and who yield ourselves to him as instruments in his hand. This life and power God has determined in and of himself, hasn't he? Well, he said through this prophet Ezekiel, and I just read some words from, that he would restore Israel from Babylon, not for them, but for his namesake. He would do it for the sake of his name. So God determined these things in himself. This great work of salvation we know has been determined in God from the foundation of the world. This working that he has done, that the Apostle Paul opens up there in Ephesians chapter 1, he, he, he decided these things in himself, not in consultation with some other human. He didn't call for volunteers to help. Who'd like to be a part of this? Who'll give me some assistance here? No, God himself did these things. He commissioned the Son who took on the body that was prepared for him and walked here among us and gave himself to his Father's will. He spoke his words, he did his works, and then when the hour came, remember he said, for this purpose I came to this hour? When the hour came, he said, Father, glorify your name. Mm. Amen. Now my soul's troubled, Father, glorify your name. Yes, his soul was troubled because he knew what he was entering into, but he was doing it for his Father's name. He was doing it to please the Father. He was doing it because he... He loved the Father, and he knew the Father loved him. He was doing it to fulfill those things that are listed there in Daniel chapter 9, bringing in everlasting righteousness, sealing up prophets, prophecy, all those things that are listed there. He was, he was going to do those things. He came for that purpose, and so he laid down his life and took it up again. To have a people among whom he could abide and dwell and live. To build the dwelling of God in the spirit. He was, he was doing these things. Now the, the apostles in their writings and their exposition simply tell, tells us, urges us, directs us to yield ourselves to these things. Give ourselves to the great and expansive work of God that he is unfolding in the gospel. And that he has uh, declared centuries before that he was going to do. And he pictures it for us in this manner. 
to Israel. He pictures it to Israel in this matter. Your son shall make haste, and your destroyers, those who laid you away, shall go away. They shall depart from you. The things that destroyed you, will I will remove them, in other words. They will leave. Israel as a whole was not willing, and so was not able. They were unfit vessels for his glory and his truth. Yet God used them to enhance the glory, the glory of his name in a limited fashion. In a limited fashion. In them he laid the groundwork to show that he alone was able to do, was able to accomplish and would accomplish this great redemption. That men, were, that men and the flesh were not able to do it, even when they were instructed by the schoolmaster himself. They were not able to accomplish these things. His righteousness, grace, truth, mercy, and loving kindness joined together in his son would do what nothing else could do. And such is the nature of life from above that God himself grants. Think about the, the uh, great works and words, the words and works of the apostles that the Savior worked in them after he departed. The things that he said he was going to do, the things that he promised he would accomplish in them. And they, they had no co conception of it. I can imagine that it was almost, uh, that when it did occur, they knew. But at the same time, it was like, where did this come from? How are we doing and saying these things? Yet they knew, didn't they? They knew because he had told them ahead of time. He had told them ahead of time. And so they clothed themselves with these things, all as an ornament. They bound them on as a bride does. See, the bride gladly, willingly, wanting to engage her spouse and to deliver herself to her promised one. And so the believers there in the first century bound on these things that God provided. They yielded themselves to his spirit. They yielded themselves to the preaching and teaching proclamation of the word. They yielded themselves to stand before their enemies and declare, you decide if it is right for us to obey God or obey you. You decide that. We cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. See, they bound these things on themselves and they would not let them go just as this prophet is saying. Your waste and desolate places, the land of your destruction, will even now be too small for the inhabitants, and those who swallowed you up will be far away. The authorities there in Jerusalem couldn't control what was happening, could they? It just, it just expanded and exploded, this message going everywhere, even, even when they're specifically designated leader of the persecution, Saul of Tarsus, began or, or expanded his persecution after the death of Stephen. You remember what happened? They went everywhere preaching the message. It made it worse. It made it even worse. The place, it was like the place was too small. Now, God did this work in some sense. They were perhaps a little too content to stay there, hadn't, 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 uh, hadn't conceived of actually going out and taking this message, but it worked that way in them naturally, didn't it? See, this was the course of life in them. Everywhere they went, they, being, they began declaring these things. And later on, the Spirit would say, set apart for me Saul and Barnabas for the work to which I have called them. The message went out. The believers put on these things that God had provided for them, the, the good works, this, specifically this message that God had sent his promised one and that he had fulfilled the things that the prophets had said, that Moses and the Psalms and the prophets had said. He had fulfilled these things. He had done this great work, and now they were declaring these things wherever they went. They were not ashamed. In fact, they considered themselves blessed. They were grateful that they were considered worthy, I should say, to suffer shame for his name. And they would not be quiet. They prayed, God, make us bold so that we can declare these things. See, that's them putting these things on and not letting them go. They were not ashamed of these things, 
even as we are not. And God still works these things in his people. We are glad to declare these things at every opportunity. We give testimony to one another. We're glad to speak about these things. The folks that come, uh, the, uh, just one small example, the, the folks that come out to ARM to do community service for me, uh, when they find out, some of them are not very comfortable at all when they find out what kind of place they've come into. Some of them will come in to find out about coming out there and working, and they don't come back anymore. Because they see the environment, they hear a few things, and they find out some things about what will be required of them. Like, for instance, the young women are told they have to dress a certain way, and they don't like being told that. And so they say, well, I'll, I'll check back with you, okay? Well, we never see, from, never see them again. Because we're not ashamed of these things, you see. Mm-hmm. We're glad to take a stand for the truth. Yeah. We're glad to have these works make progress in us. And we gladly yield ourselves to these things as God intends in his people. Again, it's the nature of this life from above. It is abundant. It is ever expanding and multiplying in us. And we're living this now. We see this in one another as the the truth becomes more evident and we see more of the truth and it and and it presses forward and we and we press forward with it, you might say, and and uh, it, it moves forward, and we walk in its path, and we see more and more and more of these things. It gets larger and larger in our view. And sometimes we just kind of have to catch our breath and say, where did this all come from anyway? <laughs> how, how? We're, we know that we're not making this happen. This is not manufactured, not, not by any religious process. We have no program that we're following. Not at all. We're giving ourselves to God and his word. And he is true to his promise. His power is now... I was talking to Brother Ricky about this this morning as he, as he talked about the, uh, 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 the promise of God being an index of his... Uh, uh, what, was that, what was that other word that you used, Ricky? The... Uh, his, yes, of, of his character and so forth. But he and and, and I immediately saw that this was a, uh, or a, yeah, the promise of God being an index of God's power. That's what we said. The promise of God being an index of His power, but it's also an index of His willingness. His willingness. See, not only or it, it was an index of His ability. That's what it was. We were talking about His power. It's an index of his ability, but it's also an index of his, of his willingness. God is willing to do this. We have no doubt whatsoever that God is able. He can decimate the whole earth if he pleases. He spoke it into existence. He decimated it, took life from it. He raised up life again. He brought Israel forth out of one man and him as good as dead, his wife's womb, unfruitful, but he brought that nation forth anyway, didn't he? Then sent them down into a land that was not theirs where they became a great nation. And when the time was right, he brought them out on eagles' wings out of the iron furnace and decimated the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, economically, socially, and militarily. When that famine hit the world, Egypt was the only man left standing. And they did not appreciate what Joseph had done for them and the work of God provided through him, did they? And so God wiped them clean. All of this by his power, see, and because he was willing. Well, if this was the case then in Israel, then how much more in this one man in whom he was pleased to have his fullness dwell in whom he has deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Because, brethren, we know that he's the source of this for us, don't we? He's the one who has done these things in us. Even as Peter said, he's the one who has granted these things on the day of Pentecost. He is the one who has sent these things. He said they're on the day of Pentecost. He's the one who is administering these things in us, his people today. He's still working. 
Now, there are many in the church world who don't understand when we use this kind of language about Jesus doing this and Jesus doing that or God doing this or God's eternal purpose. They say, hey, wait a minute. Where'd you get that anyway? What book did you read that in? They're not familiar with the book we read, you know. They may be familiar with the church growth books and the, and the, and the latest hoodoo voodoo uh, religiosity uh, prescriptions, you know, about how to do this and that and so forth. They may be familiar with those folks, but they're not familiar, honestly, we know this, don't we? They're not familiar with the book that we read. And so when we use this biblical language, they say, right, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've seen it in people's faces when I've preached over the last five years, when I've gone to a few other places just around this area and preached, they're frightened. They're uncomfortable with my language and the passion with which I speak. They're not comfortable with that. But God is doing this work in us, and we are not ashamed to give him glory and to honor him because of it. And we recognize that at one time we were too small for these things. As the prophet says here, the place is too small for me. Give me a place where I may dwell. Mm -hmm. But he's making us bigger, isn't he? <laughs> he's expanding us. Our hearts and our minds, that is. Where he dwells in us, he's enlarging us. So that he will have a place to dwell in us because he is very large, you know. He needs a large place and he intends to have a large, he will have a large place in which to dwell. And so he's building us all together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. Us and the great cloud of witnesses, those who were not made perfect without us and those who will come after us as he tarries, should he tarry much longer. All of us will be built together into this dwelling of God. And he will work and produce these things in us. These very things that the prophet speaks about here. God was working in these believers. His will. I had not seen, ear had not heard these things. The law of Moses didn't generate it in Israel. But the gospel of Christ Jesus, which we have heard about, this great salvation which the grace of God has brought to us, it is teaching us. And we are casting off then these things that encumber, these things that hindered, these things that obstruct, we're casting these things off by his direction, his power, his leading, his teaching. We, we, we let them go, and he teaches us to live godly and sensible lives in this present age. And we are looking for, and we speak about this all the time, don't we? We're looking for, hoping in, the coming of our master and our savior. We're not just trying to fix our problems straighten out our lives, teach one another how to raise our children and grandchildren. No, we're not doing that. We don't preach sermons about family management and marriage management, do we? God is able to do that. He's doing that in us, all of us who are yielded. Now, we've had some experience with those who are not yielded to him, and we've seen what's happened in their lives, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. But those of us who are yielded to him, we see the effects. We participate in the benefits, don't we? It's a very personal participation. And we are personally benefiting. But we're not seeking those particular benefits. We are seeking the Lord himself. We want to walk in the light and the truth with him. And we know then that every good and precious thing will come as we walk with him. We'll not lose anything. In fact, we will gain more and more and more to the point to where we have to, we have to clear out certain things. Well, we talk about clearing out certain things of our lives, don't we? Getting, getting rid of some things because they're interfering. We've got to bring some other things in. New things. Works that God is doing. So we've got to clear these things out. Let them go. Cast them off like they threw the wheat off the ship there. That was on its way to Rome to make the ship lighter. Well, we're casting these things off. And we know, and we're willing to accept, 
that we may get stuck in a sandbar somewhere and the waves and the winds of the world may beat us to pieces, <laughs> but we'll all make it to shore safely. He has promised that we will. He has promised that we will. So the increase, the power, and the strength are characteristic of God's kingdom, his rule in and among his people. As he works these things in us, he himself accomplishes these things. Think about the, the enemies of the apostles being confounded. Peter sleeping soundly between the soldiers there in Herod's prison after the sacrifice of James. Sleeping so soundly the angel had to poke him to wake him up. Tell him to get up. Peter was sleeping so soundly he thought he was having a dream. He had to come to himself out in the street. Well, this is real. I'm out. <laughs> because the power of God had worked in him to where he wasn't concerned about the circumstances. Just like, uh, who was it that mentioned about Hananiah, Ezra, and Mishael last night or this morning? <laughs> Didn't matter. See, we're not careful. Yeah, you know, Brother Ricky was talking about this this morning, wasn't he? We're not careful to answer you about these things. They, they weren't concerned. See, they'd already given themselves to God. And so the particular details of their circumstances right then didn't matter because they'd entrusted themselves to God as a faithful creator. And they didn't know the things that we know. They didn't know the things the apostles knew. And the apostles, in some sense, didn't know the things that we know. Because they, the things that they wrote about have enlarged in us. They've gotten larger. Which is their intent. Now, I know those words would be blasphemy in some places and cases. And some of the people that we've associated with in the past to think about us knowing some things the apostles didn't know. But that was the intent of the apostles and their writings. For the word of God to get larger. For the per perception and perspective of the believers to, to become larger and larger and larger in the things of God. As they made progress in the truth. That they would see more and more and more. God has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to the church for this very purpose. That we would be stable. That we would increase. That our engagement of this life and one another would build up the body in love. And that each member and each part doing its work would grow. Build, up, build itself up in love. Build the body up in love, that is. And so we see more and more of these things. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs were, sang, were being sung in the stocks and the dungeon of Philippi when the earthquake hit. And the men who thought they would stop these Jews from their preaching and whatever else was going on, who were impeding the economic values of their friends, uh, we'll just squelch them. We'll just, we'll just put our heel on their neck and stop it. That's what we'll do. But they couldn't stop it, could they? And when Paul and Silas and Timothy left Philippi, they left a nucleus of believers in Christ Jesus there. That continued to grow and expand. He wrote back to them later, thanked them for the gifts that they gave him. And we still speak about them today. The Apostle Paul taking leadership of that ship. When everyone else had given up hope. Here was a man in chains. For religious reasons. He wasn't even a real criminal. And the ones who had custody of him knew it. But that was their orders. And when everything fell apart. Who was the one who stood up to speak? With confidence? And took control of the whole ship? 272 people I think it was. It was this man. It was this man. And it did turn out just as he said, didn't it? The ship was lost, but they all made it to shore alive, just as he said. So the circumstances of their lives didn't control these preachers of the gospel wherever they went. Brethren, this is still true for those who live by faith and walk in this truth. It's still true. God continues to produce in his people, wherever, 
they are, whether our lives are comfortable or not. Many of your testimony of that, those of you who pull on up state, pulled up your stakes somewhere and, and disrupted your lives to move here to this place, not knowing how secure your lives would be here, but just so you could join yourselves to our fellowship and our truth here. And then those of you who went through the wind and the fire this last summer, you didn't let that control you. We continued meeting. You continued preaching. You continued serving God and honoring and blessing God. Every opportunity you've had, you've continued in those things. See, where did that come from? My sister uh, said this morning, it's, it, it's almost like it wasn't that hard passing through those things. Huh. Well, where did that come from? You can still hear news reports from time to time about the awful suffering that some people are going through. And it's agonizing for them. And the media tugs at our heartstrings about it. But God has provided. He's been faithful. You've been faithful. He has supported you with his everlasting arms. You took you, Because you've taken shelter underneath the shadow of his wings. And so your place increases. And you increase and get larger and larger and larger. This is the nature of God's work. Transforming us from death to life. His favor, his power, his knowledge, and his strength working in us to illustrate this reality. The evil ones that afflicted us and troubled us in life, they've departed. Not totally, of course. They, they make an attempt every once in a while, but they do not dominate. They do not control. We are not subject to them any longer. Any longer. We've subjected ourselves to the Most High. We've subjected ourselves to the one to whom they answer. Remember the demon-possessed man whom the sons of Sceva tried to use? Paul I know, or Jesus I know, and Paul I've heard about. Who are you? Those demonic powers knew about these men and their work. They were familiar with the things that were being done in the earth. None of them were attacking Paul, were they? The demons, that is. And the girl there in Philippi that got Paul thrown into the dungeon. <laughs> I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. There was no fight. There was no fight at all. Paul didn't want the advertisement. He tolerated it for a while. And then he just cast him out. That was the end of it as far as the demon was concerned. He did what Paul said. So these principalities and powers, well, Jesus had triumphed over them. Just as God removed the enemies of Israel, as they were faithful, he removed their enemies. There was, there, there, they hardly had to fight in some cases. In that one particular battle of the five kings in the days of Joshua, God killed more with the hailstones than Israel killed with the sword. And then we have the incident in the days of Jehoshaphat, where the prophet said, you go out, and you'll not even have to fight. And so they sent the Levites out with their trumpets and their singing ahead of all the people. And they walked out to the brow of the hill and looked down. And the armies had fought among themselves and destroyed each other. And they just went and took the plunder. Well, God is able to do that, see. Our Savior triumphed over his enemies even in his weakness. Satan's hatred, you see. When God withdrew his hand and allowed the evil one to enter, he could not resist the opportunity. And he did not know that his own actions were his undoing. That in a sense he was cutting his own throat. Or we should say maybe he was bruising his own head. Except that we know it was the seed of woman who bruised his head, don't we? But he just... He just made himself available. The master made himself available. 
And the evil one made himself available. Though the master knew what was happening, the evil one didn't. He did not know the wisdom and righteousness of God most high, and he was dealt a fatal blow. And part of the evidence of that is that when the master's grave opened, other graves opened as well. There was an overflow of power in and around Jerusalem, life-giving, resurrection power. And brethren, it's still here, and it's in us. It's working in us. That's what the Apostle Paul says there in Ephesians chapter 1, according to to the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. So it works in us. It's not some, it's not some uh, emotional or, or mental or uh, manipulation of our habits that causes us to change certain things and so forth and so on, uh, like the uh, psychobabblers would have us think. It's God's power that works in his people. His power is calculated for that now. He can create a world. He can destroy a world. He can free a nation from within another nation and held in slavery. He can change a human heart and make it willing in the day of his power. He will work in us to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And we are glad. We are glad. We spent enough time in those other things, giving ourselves to the things that corrupt and destroy. We spent enough time there. The enemies of the Savior were helpless to stop this message from penetrating every strata of society. Even so, it continues to penetrate, doesn't it? Brother Bob just gave us evidence of that just from us. That's just from us, not counting all the others who were preaching the truth. That's just from us, how this truth penetrates through the tools that God has granted us, people willingly yielding themselves to God's power and truth and grace, his righteousness and his mercy that emerged in Christ Jesus. The power that's compressed in a message that appeals to the hearts of the hearers, provoking faith in God. He destroyed him who had the power of death. He entered into death as a man. He entered into the strong man's house and tied him up and took his possessions. We are it. And as we yield ourselves to him, he takes more and more of us, and we are glad. <laughs> he takes more and more of us, and then he gives us more and more. He works it in us as we yield our hearts and our minds to him. He destroyed the works of the devil. The chains of sin and death and its works fall from the believer, even as the chains fell off Peter. They fall from us as well. We know if, 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 those, if we were still chained in that way, we'd not be producing these things. We'd not be able to speak about these things. These things would not be increasing in us. Our eyes would not be open and enlightened more and more and more as we make progress together. But those things are happening, and it's not by us. We're not following some curriculum, some multiple-step pattern, system, or methodology. We're simply walking in the light and the truth. We're yielding ourselves to God. We're emphasizing the word of God, the truth of God, the gospel of our Savior Christ Jesus, and allowing it to naturally expand and increase in us, its power to multiply in us, make us more and more stable, and able then to speak about these things. Satan is cast out. And the Spirit of God now imbibes, abides in his people as we imbibe the word of God and drink fully at the well of salvation, his power and his strength. Such a one who walks in the Spirit will not fulfill the works of the flesh. They cannot serve two masters. We serve the one. We yield ourselves to him who is Lord of all, whose name is Lord of Lords, and king of kings. We are among those who are the faithful, the called, and the chosen. We are among them. Some may think these are fables. Some may think these are legends. Methods of motivation. To stir people up. 
and endear them to their religion and to their masters. Not so. This is a record of the great work of God, the promise of God that he is working and fulfilling in us. He's already fulfilled it in those who have gone before us. He's fulfilling it in us now, increasing these things. And the prophet here is simply using these words about children, about sons, and so forth uh, to communicate this message about increase and producing and his power and multiplication in us of himself of himself who's begotten these since i've lost my children i'm desolate there were times before we came to the lord where we felt that way didn't we and we were we were desolate but not now not now because he is working in us we have Evidence, faith is the evidence. Faith is the persuasion, things hoped for, things not seen. But we have an increase of that, don't we? We have the working of this faith in us. We can't be quiet either. It's working in us. It's increasing and multiplying in us. The darkness has departed. Because the sunrise from on high has entered and abides in us and has made us children of light. And so we're walking forward. And we know where we're walking. We know. It increases. That light increases in us. And we are in a position to add to the initial things that God worked in us. Not by our own power. Not at all. Because he continues to work in us. So we're just being diligent to add to these things according to his agenda, according to God's will, in aiming at the fulfillment of his purpose in us. He's done these things in his people. He's chosen us in the beloved. He's caused us to be born again into a living hope. He's reproduced his nature in us. He gives us armor for protection. We've spoken about that, prayed about that this evening, haven't we? We're pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So that we will be able to say then, as the Apostle Paul wrote here to the believers, talking about his own ministry, but these, this is not just an apostolic ministry. It did work in them, but in our measure, it works in all of us as well. Some negative things, some positive things. Patience, tribulations, and needs, and distresses, and stripes. These are words that come from 2 Corinthians 6, verses 3 through 10. Distresses, and stripes, and imprisonments, and tumults, and labors, and sleeplessness, and fastings, and purity, in knowledge, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere... See, there are some negative things that affect us, but there are positive things that undergird us and support us. God's power and his working in us. Uh, the power of God, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, by honor and dishonor. By, now he kind of puts them together, the positive, by honor and dishonor. See, from some people dishonor us, but other people honor us. God honors us, of course, but others honor us. We honor one another. Others may dishonor us, but we honor one another, and other believers who see the truth that we see honor us as well. Evil report and good report. We experience both. Seen as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well-known, as dying yet and behold, we live as chastened, yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. Possessing all things. They shall bring your sons in their arms. Your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. And God is producing these things in us, through us. It's his power, his design, his structure, his intent and purpose. And we're yielding ourselves to it with joy and gladness because we know it is right. 
We know that it's life. We've tasted of corruption and death, sin and death. Now we want life, and he has granted it to us in his own son, Christ Jesus, and we continue to abide in it and walk in it and rejoice in it. By these things, we know that God's work is present in us. This is part of the reward of faith that he grants us, confirming these things to us by an increasing understanding of God's will and God's way. And so as we probe these things, as we extend ourselves to take hold of that for which he has taken hold of us in Christ Jesus, he grants us understanding. We see where we are, we see where we've been, we see where we're going. By faith. Now there are a lot of things in the world that we don't know for sure. We don't know how the details of precisely how God's going to work it out, but we do know the details of how he's going to work these things out in our faith and by the power of his son, his spirit, and his word that is in us. We do know those things. That's becoming clearer and clearer to us as this light increases. All these things belong to us as God make these things, makes these things work together for our good, and we increase and progress in the good and precious things of God that he has always intended to give to his people, those who are sons of Abraham, who walk according to the faith of Abraham. See, this is what he's always intended to do. We've seen it demonstrated again and again and again in his people. He's demonstrating in it us now as we increase in these good and precious things of God. Thank you, brethren. God's grace and peace to you, Brother Jeremy now has our exhortation.